Hello, everyone, and welcome on behalf of the College of Arts and Sciences. I am your moderator, Clara Davison. Thank you so much for joining us for Book Club. Today, we will discuss Little Women by Louisa May Alcott, selected because it was one of the most recommended titles by more than 100 Department of English alumni who shared their top 10 book lists earlier this year. Thank you to our Department of English faculty, College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Professor of English and Chair of the Department of English, Robin Warhol, and Professor Susan Williams for sharing their expertise with us today. We are recording this webinar and we will share the video in a follow-up email in addition um, to some other resources about the book. Attendees, you are muted and your video is off. If you have a comment or question to add to the conversation, you can share by typing or by speaking. If you would like to type, click Q&A at the bottom of your screen to submit your comment or question. If you would like to speak, click raise hand at the bottom of your screen. I will enable your audio and call on you by name. A pop up to unmute yourself will appear in the middle of your screen. You will click OK and then you can share your remark. We already have about 50 folks on this webinar, uh, so we will not be able to respond to every comment and question, but we will do our best to address as many as possible. So to get us started, Robin and Susan will share some opening remarks about Little Women, including responses to some of your pre-submitted questions. So after their remarks, we will open up the conversation. Again, uh, please submit your questions and comments by clicking Q&A to type or raise hand to speak. All right, Susan, take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here with everyone on this uh, webinar and particularly with Robin, who I'm really looking forward to talking about this book with. Uh, I am so glad that Little Women is in this top 10 list. It's one of my favorite books, both as a uh, personal reader and even as a young child and also as a professional scholar, I've looked at it both ways. And I actually gave some thought today about whether to come to you from my house or from my office in Denny Hall, which I was in today. We are teaching some face-to-face. -face. And for those of you who are alumni, I'm happy to say that's going well. Students are really glad to be face-to-face -face and are paying a lot of really good attention to what's going on as a result of that. Um, and it's a pleasure to see their attentiveness in that face-to-face -face context. But I wanted to come home because I think for so many people, Little Women is a comforting book. It's a book that has a lot of memories and uh, that is some for some people, a book they return to again and again. And that's kind of a comfortable book that uh, has good connotations. And then you keep finding more things when you reread it. Book historians talk about two kinds of reading. Some, uh, one is intensive and one is extensive. Intensive is when you keep going back to the same book and see more things in it. Uh, and extensive is when you try to be as voracious as possible in reading lots of things. Uh, I think that most of us are probably a little bit of both. But for me, Little Women is an intensive book, one that I've gone back to a lot of times and seen different things in it at different times. And I think that's true for many readers uh, as well. So I'm looking forward to talking about it with you today. I wanted just to start us off by talking about my own experience with the book kind of in three stages, uh, what it meant to me when I first read it and then how I thought about it at different points uh, since then in terms of my scholarly life. Little Women is a book that I really remember reading when I was about 12 one summer for a summer reading project. And I specifically remember finishing the second volume, uh, sitting on a swing in a, in a summer house, summer kind of lake house, um, and just needing to finish the book and also being distraught that Beth died. And that was what I remembered mostly about the book is that Beth died and in volume one she had lived and survived scarlet fever and the fact that she then died in volume two was something that was very sad to me and really did make me emotionally sad. I think I might have even uh, cried a bit. And that, that question of whether Little Women is sentimental and emotional and uh, a kind of uh, 
memento of childhood, all of those feelings are part of its longevity. Uh, and beside that is the fact that it's quite realistic in many ways, and many readers have seen themselves in different characters in the book. So I think when I read it and I was 12 and I was really thinking about Beth, it was probably because she played the piano and I played the piano. We were about the same age. Um, I didn't have sisters, but I liked the idea of having sisters. And so I was really sad uh, when, when Beth died. And honestly, I think when I started rereading the book, I kind of hoped it would have a different ending with her. And I think that's an experience that a lot of readers have had with Little Women, hoping that it might end a little bit differently, and in particular, probably with Joe's marriage to Professor Bear, which we'll get to. Um, but that idea of continually rereading is something that I think is really, really great about this book. Uh, the second time that I read it with real care was in graduate school. And uh, I read it in the context of a 19th century American literature class, and I read it in a very different way. Uh, because I was looking at it for the kind of cultural effect it had had and also its discussion about women's writing. Um, and interestingly, at that time, I started paying a lot more attention to Marmy, who got interested, uh, who got called up as somebody that, that some of you were interested in. And this is my Madame Alexander doll of Marmy that I got in my first part of reading when I was about 12. But I started thinking about her more in graduate school. So I wanted to show you my Madame Alexander Marmy doll. There's a whole set of these. They started in the 1930s. I think they're still made. Um, this one, I think I got for Christmas one year, but um, here's my Marmy doll. And the reason when I read it in graduate school that I thought a lot about Marmy um, and motherhood generally is that there was a lot of study going on at the time um, in the 1980s and 1990s about how mothers in the 19th century especially had a lot of cultural power um, and trying to reclaim motherhood as being some something that was sort of socially important and therefore seeing that that Marmy as a figure and the fact that she was so prominent in the book in in leading her young women to be uh, good wives eventually and good citizens was really important. Um, and by the way, one question was, why is Marmy called by her first name? Um, and Marmy is just the word for mother, like mommy. And as far as I know, she doesn't really have a first name other than mommy or Marmy. Um, and Robin, you might want to later, you can talk to us about a New England accent, about why Marmy sounds like M-A-R-M-E-E -E with a New England accent. But in any case, Marmy really is mommy and mother. Um, and uh, thinking about Marmy when you read the book and what motherhood does really puts the emphasis on the growing up part of those sisters. And so I also, reading it in graduate school, thought about Meg as the oldest daughter who gets married and deals with being a mother and struggling to kind of maintain her independence and sanity at the same time that she's got kids. She's the first one to do that. All of that meant something. But it also meant really thinking about Joe as a writer and what that meant to, to sort of think about a woman writer, a women who were writing about motherhood and women in general, um, in the mid 19th century at the same time that we had Melville and Hawthorne and other uh, male writers talking essentially about um, the push west and the wilderness. And so to talk about motherhood was reclaiming some space that was very culturally important. And that was something that was really important to me in graduate school. Um, thinking about Joe as a writer, I'm sure we'll come back to this because all of the adaptations, uh, uh, especially the two most recent movie versions, really emphasize Joe as a writer. Uh, and the main thing I want to say at the beginning is that I think Little Women is uh, important in showing Joe being someone who is actively working with the publishing industry. But I also think it's important that in uh, Little Women, at least, um, Alcott does not have Joe kind of finishing the novel with the triumphant writing of Little Women itself. In fact, there is no writing of Little Women going on in um, the book itself. She writes instead a kind of philosophical novel that she ends up tearing apart and having a hard time with. She burns a lot of her writing because it's not appropriate. And at the end of the novel, she basically decides to put her 
attention to her family and to her school and does not become the sort of famous writer that we think of with Alcott until two books later. And by the time we get to Joe's Boys, um, she is really famous writer and kind of has written the equivalent of Little Women. So uh, that's one thing we may want to get back to is why so many uh, of the adaptations have focused on the writing of Little Women as being sort of the story of it. Um, the other thing that's important about women writing, women's writing in uh, Little Women is that Alcott herself was commissioned to write this book. It didn't come out of sort of her soul searching to say this was the book she wanted to write. She was commissioned specifically to write a girl's book. And uh, that was a market niche that her publisher, Thomas Niles, thought would be really effective and it turned out to be right. But it was not sort of her main um, goal in life to write Little Women, but it did make her fame. So the last thing I want to talk about is my most recent thinking about this book, uh, which has to do with its relationship to uh, social reform and to race and to, in general to the idea of being socially engaged. Uh, a lot of readings of the book think about the sisters and the domestic home life and uh, that family, but it's also a book that at its core is thinking about how you interact with the world in terms of reform and making the world better. And some of it is at the edges of the book, but I've been interested lately in thinking about that, that sort of um, reform part of it. And just three very quick things I'll, I'll, I'll mention that we might come back to. Number one, it's a Civil War novel. Um, and uh, there are lots of allusions to the Civil War and to the fact in particular that uh, the fate of ins formerly enslaved uh, people is a problem in terms of education and access to education. And so it's important that at the end of the book, uh, when Jo starts a school, she makes it integrated racially and has a formerly enslaved um, child who's now a student in her school. And I think that's a real sign of sort of Alcott's interest in reform. And it's also something that probably resonates with us today. Uh, in addition, there's a lot of emphasis in the book generally with using your talents to sort of do reform. Amy, as a painter, raises money uh, for various causes by selling her art and eventually also starts a school to try to help young girls become better artists. And in general, the idea of really working for um, civic reform is something that's in the book uh, a little bit in the sidelines, but I think very much there. And uh, I think the more that you reread it, the more you see that at work, even in minor characters. Uh, Aunt March, who is one of my also favorite characters now, um, is one example of a very philanthropic uh, widow who actually starts the school that Joe start Joe uh, eventually takes over by giving the house to have it in to Joe. And I think that Aunt March is a really good example also of somebody who's thinking about using her wealth for good. So the civic idea of it is really important too. So I've kind of gone from crying about Beth to thinking about how you use your money for good and um, civic education. And I think that just shows how much Little Women can be reread and you see different things every time. Thank you so much, Susan. So now we'll turn it over to Robin for her introductory remarks. Thank you, Clara. Thanks, Susan. That's such a great introduction. And as you said, kind of a, a survey of the spread of ways to think about little women. Um, Susan asked me to um, demonstrate for you because I lived in New England for a long time why Marmy is mommy and of course if you think about what the Boston accent sounds like pack the cat and have a yad mommy um, that's how it would be spelled I noticed also in Amy's will there's a word where she sticks an r in there where you wouldn't pronounce the r and it's just it's just a a, a Massachusetts accent so um, it, that that I think helps explain why it's spelled so peculiarly um, I uh, was interested in questions that uh, some of you sent to us uh, in advance of this event, and I decided that I wanted to focus my comments on uh, two of the questions in particular. Uh, the questions were, is this a feminist book? And 
is this a marriage plot novel? And uh, my answers are yes and no. Uh, and I'll just talk a little bit about why I would say that. And um, in my comments, I also want to make some contrast between what Alcott does with a novel and what Greta Gerwig does in that, I think, really beautiful adaptation um, that just came out this last year. Uh, Greta Gerwig is adapting Little Women to make it into a modern feminist story and to make it into a marriage plot novel. But Little Women, as we read it, um, is a 19th century feminist novel. That's something very different from what we would see as feminist in a, a novel today. Uh, and it's not really a marriage plot novel, even though the tradition of the marriage plot uh, kind of distorts uh, what Alcott has to do with this novel at the end. And I want to just talk a little bit about that first. So my, my first question is, well, what kind of a novel is this? A marriage plot novel, everybody who loves 19th century women writers is very familiar with marriage plot. Sort of the canonical marriage plot novels would be Pride and Prejudice and Jane Eyre. Um, those are novels that follow the perfect pattern of the marriage plot. The marriage plot is girl meets boy, girl loses boy, girl marries boy in the end. Uh, and that will be the trajectory of the main plot of the novel. So what happens in the middle between the meeting of the hero and the heroine and their marriage at the end are complications, misunderstandings, uh, uh, arguments or disputes, family conflicts, things that keep the couple apart. Uh, and usually what it boils down to is some kind of profound fundamental misunderstanding, as with Elizabeth and Darcy and Pride and Prejudice, that they can't overcome until uh, some climactic action happens in Pride and Prejudice. It's Lydia's elopement and Mr. Darcy's intervention. In Jane Eyre, of course, it's the burning down of Thornfield by um, Rochester's mad wife. Um, something like that has to happen to then break down uh, the, the conflict and the barriers that, to getting the couple together. Now, um, what Gerwig does with Joe's story in the movie is to turn it into a marriage plot because uh, what Gerwig does is have Joe fairly early in the movie meet uh, Professor Bear and then they get into conflict with each other, right? He makes her mad and hurts her feelings by telling her, you're so much better than all this sensational fiction you've been writing. You know, that's crap. You, you're a better person than that. You should be writing a whole different kind of fiction. And that it makes her angry. It causes a rift between them. When she goes home then from New York, she writes Little Women, which is of course exactly what he'd been encouraging her to write. And then in the end, he shows up again. They can uh, reconcile because now, you know, she's lived up to his expectations for her um, and she's forgiven him. And they can, we assume, get married in the end. Now, they don't actually, uh, Gerwig doesn't give us a, a wedding scene, um, but we see this household, which is the school, and he's there and she's there. And honestly, the, when I saw the movie in the theater, I wasn't positive that they were married. But I talked to several other people who'd watched it and said, yeah, of course they are, of course they are. So that's, so that's making Little Women into a marriage plot. And then the other, the other sort of subplots, the other girls' stories become kind of subservient uh, to that larger arc of Joe's um, getting coupled up. Um, now, in the movie, uh, of course, Joe, as an author, is struggling with a publisher who's telling her, nobody's going to want to buy this book unless you marry these characters off. They have to have happy endings, which only can mean they have to be happy wives. Good wives, I guess, is the name of that um, second volume of Little Women. It becomes part of the story of Gerwig's Little Women, that Joe has to compromise her own inspiration and writing realistic tale of these four women's lives, little women's lives, by making sure each of them gets married off so that it will satisfy the customers. And the marriage plot, it's so powerful if you think about it. Um, in, in fact, it's very rare for a novel from the 18th or 19th century from France or from England to end in any way other than for the heroine either to get married or to die. Those are the only ways that they could end. And there are very few weird exceptions. Charlotte Bronte's Villette, 
uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And then toward the end of the century, it starts to change a little bit, but there are very few exceptions where at the end, it isn't absolutely clear that the heroine is married. And even that one's kind of vague about it. So, you know, there's this, um, this dominant ideology, right? That says that for a book to be enjoyable, the heroine must marry at the end, otherwise she has to die and that's tragic. Uh, there's no possibility of a novel ending with the heroine becoming a professional author and supporting herself, right? Even though the novelists themselves, Jane Austen, George Eliot, uh, Louisa May Alcott, the novelists themselves were professional authors who didn't marry, didn't have children, uh, and who were devoted to their uh, professions. So the, uh, what happens to the novel of Little Women is it doesn't start out as a marriage plot novel. There's no, you, you think it is because you think Joe and Lori are the, the hero and the heroine because we're used to reading marriage plot novels. So they must be, they're friends, they get along, they like each other so much, they're obviously kind of attracted to each other. Then they have a break, right? When Lori proposes to Joe and she has to turn him down. And, and readers, since the beginning of, the, of, of, uh, of the, the span of readers of Little Women have expected that of course, Joe and Lori will get together in the end. And there's all this disappointment um, when that isn't what happens. But it's because it's not a marriage plot novel. So no, Joe isn't supposed to marry Lori. The, the, her story doesn't follow that arc. It follows the arc of first becoming a professional writer and then marrying Professor Bear, um, which is always very dissatisfying to the marriage plot fan uh, reading the novel because he's old, he's dumpy, he's not attractive, he's not Mr. Darcy, <laughs> he's not even Mr. Rochester. There's nothing romantic about him. And it seems to be such a kind of, um, I don't know, like a sellout on Alcott's part to give her wonderful heroine to this guy who is not our idea of the romantic hero. Um, but it's true that publishers pressed Alcott not to let Joe be a, a, a spinster, uh, but rather to be a married woman at the end. And the fact that Joe at least has a school that she's running and that she will continue to write means that she is that exceptional married woman who will have some kind of autonomy to have a public influence. And this is what's important about what Susan was saying about um, civic reform is what could, what could a woman do uh, in the middle of the 19th century in America, if she wanted to have an influence on politics, on society, if she wanted to change the world. There were very few uh, opportunities open to her. She obviously couldn't run for office. She couldn't be a minister unless she happened to be in a splinter Methodist group where she could actually preach from a pulpit. She couldn't be a businesswoman or a physician or any other kind of public figure who might be in a position to be making social change. She only really had two options to her if she wanted to make a difference in society. She could be a teacher or she could be a writer and that was it. So Joe gets to be both and that's why I say it's um, a feminist novel from a 19th century perspective because given the possibilities for a middle-class woman's um, life. Uh, Alcott gives Joe as much uh, of, a, of a, a possibility for having an influence and changing the world as a woman is allowed to have. Um, and she gives us these other models in Meg, you know, the, the domestic woman who's, who's totally contented just to be a wife and mother. In Amy, the upper-class woman, because of Lori's wealth, who can by her philanthropy make a difference, um, not, but in a private way, right? Not by becoming a public figure. But Jo, um, just as at the very beginning of the novel, her saying, I wish I was a boy, I hate being a girl. Uh, at the very end, her being a woman with a, a professional mission of, the, of education and also of writing, that's as feminist as it can get in the 1860s uh, in, in America. Um, so, um, I would, that's why I say, I don't think it's a marriage plot novel, although the marriage plot has a lot to do, I mean, the, the influence of the marriage plot has a lot to do with why it ends the way that it does. I do think it's a feminist novel, even though 
it's very easy to look at it from a 21st century perspective and say, oh, these women, you know, they're so limited, they're so narrow, they're, they're, not, they're not able to break out of this, you know, being these little women, which is this patriarchal name that their father gave them when they were children, right? Uh, they can never really quite overcome that. The best they can do is be good wives. That's a 21st century perspective. From a 19th century perspective, it's definitely a feminist work. So that's what I had to say. And um, we're ready, I think, now for your questions and contributions. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll get started with the Q&A here. Um, so again, attendees, please do submit your questions by clicking Q&A to type or click raise hand if you'd like to share a comment by speaking. Uh, so our first comment from Susan, I disagree with the comment that some have made that Alcott soft pedals her feminism in the book. I feel that Alcott did a great job of treading the line between being overly moralizing and voicing her feminist views. I think that the combination of these conflicting aspects is part of what makes the book so popular. It doesn't talk down to the younger readers with whom it tends to be popular. Thoughts? Susan, do you want to say something about feminism since I just had my say? Um, I, you covered a lot of what I would want to say. I definitely think the notion that it is sort of multiple and it's, um, it, it gives you different ways to enter into the feminist question it is a part of why it can continue to be meaningful. Um, and I think that I, I definitely agree with that sort of um, notion. And I think it's interesting that 30 years ago or so, when I first started reading a lot of scholarship by feminists on uh, Alcott in particular, it was sort of uniformly um, angry at the fact that Joe is squelched by her marriage, really, and not able to write as much, that it was this sense of um, kind of lost opportunity, as opposed to what Robin was just saying about where you get to be a writer, have um, be married, and have a school as a way to kind of have these multiple ways of entering into feminism. Um, and I think that more recently in general, uh, both scholars and readers are kind of coming down to the line that, that it's, um, it, it resonates to say that you don't have to choose necessarily between having a marriage and having, this, and having a career as a writer, et cetera, that it's kind of moving toward that path of, of both and rather than either or. Um, but I do think that one other, aspect I would add to the feminist side is sort of Alcott outside of the book. Um, she, just to be clear, did not get married herself um, and did not really want to get married. Um, she, and she, she wrote that first volume of Little Women, kind of commissioned to do it, as I said, uh, and was just going to end it there if, it, if nobody bought it. Um, and it's true, as Robin said, that the publishers kind of stressed, and as Greta Gerwig says, you know, making the marriage plot or the marriage at the end, that it wasn't just the publishers. Um, there was a lot of fan mail that uh, Alcott got that said, um, please, please, please have Joe marry Lori or have Joe get married. And for, for many letters, uh, for about three months between when Alcott finished volume one and she wrote volume two, she said things like, I will not marry, have uh, Joe get married to please anyone. Uh, she does not need to get married. She was really holding that up. And I think that was really going back to her own position as a single woman, um, which she remained her whole life. Uh, there is a sort of Lori-ish figure in her background uh, who she met on her own European tour, which she did rather than Amy, the Amy figure uh, at a pivotal time in her 20s. And there's a, a man who is Hungarian who she may have loved and kind of built Laurie a little bit on, but she really didn't want to get married. And she was very uh, influenced by the transcendentalists that she lived with and among and conquered and um, really did feel that way. So I think um, she definitely was interested in singleness and in saying that that was something that would be okay to have um, and the sort of legal implications of that, et cetera. Um, and 
whether she would call that feminist, probably not exactly, but she definitely did not herself think that marriage was completely essential to a good life. I could actually add just a couple of things that are suggested to me by the, the terms in which that question came across about making a balance between the moralizing and the feminism. Um, I, I was trying to pay attention this time to what the content of Marmy's moralizing is. Uh, and I think that a lot of the values that she's espousing are the values of contemporary feminism. For instance, she's constantly telling, counseling the girls, don't think so much about yourself. Think about the larger group. Think about the larger good. I look, I, I, I had to sacrifice my darling husband because this, you know, this, this war matters and what matters for the greater good is what we need to prioritize for ourselves. That anti-individualism, that's actually a very contemporary feminist view. Um, the, and there are, there are other things when she talks about how, you know, I'm angry every day, but I, um, I've learned how to manage um, my anger. And it sounds like she's saying, your father makes me shut up, right? Because he puts his finger to his lips and she buttons her lips. But in fact, what she's talking about is how she's managed to learn to express herself in ways that are more effective um, than just blaring her anger. So, um, so I think that even the moralizing, there are ways in which you can reconcile that with even what we think of as feminism today. Uh, and I think um, the we talked about Greta Gerwig a little bit, and um, I think that, that, that there's definitely the angry Marmy in um, the most recent Little Women, where she's sort of saying she and Joe are very similar and kind of having that anger and learning to channel it. But I think really the 1994 Gillian Armstrong version, uh, which had Susan Sarandon playing uh, Marmy, also was very interested in that version of um, contemporary feminism that you just talked about, Robin, where uh, it was really giving her a lead role in much, as much as Joe and uh, trying to make that moralizing pr socially productive, I guess, is the way to, to put it. Um, and that gets with that whole sort of strength of the domestic sphere and then beyond it um, also. Uh, I just want to put in here in terms of um, Alcott's background and the feminist and the marriage plot before we move in, move on from it, that one of Alcott's top favorite books was The Scarlet Letter, um, which is one of my favorite books too. So Hawthorne's 1850 novel, and he was a neighbor of um, the Alcott, so she knew him. But what she liked about The Scarlet Letter and wrote about is that Hester Prem um, was such an independent kind of woman who actually is married, but then has an affair and then doesn't really end up with either um, man, except eventually in death, but she doesn't die immediately. So uh, she kind of lives as a single woman. So I think that says something also about where Alcott was. Next question from Shauna. When I was at Ohio State, class of 1974, Little Women was not considered worthy of scholarly comment. Mm -hmm. Professors openly sneered at both Little Women and Gone with the Wind. I have been astonished to see many professors today teaching and writing about little women. What do you think has changed? Also, my mom had all the little women Madame Alexander dolls. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of those little women Alexander dolls. Do you want to start with that, Raman? Actually, Susan, I'd like you to lead because I know this is part of your story as a scholar. Um, if you want to talk about what happened to you in graduate school. Yeah, so um, it is true that for a long time, Little Women wasn't thought as actually American literature generally, and then eventually, especially works like Gone with the Wind and Little Women were, were not something that you studied. And actually in lists today of what's most commonly taught, it's still not as high as you might think. Um, and there's some very principled reasons that some educators, particularly in high schools, give about that, which is essentially they don't want to ruin the book by teaching it. They want people to have their private experience. Um, but in terms of the, the kind of getting from the 1970s to now, my story about that is, as I said, that I uh, studied it in graduate school. Um, and what I didn't mention is that the, the person I studied it, studied it with is named Richard Broadhead, very distinguished American literature scholar and became the president of Duke University who was teaching it really for the first time when I uh, studied it with him. And he acknowledged that he was reading it on a plane once and um, basically hid the cover 
because it was embarrassing for him or people didn't quite know what to make of the fact that he, this, this uh, Yale professor, was reading Little Women even in a plane. Um, and the reason it changed for him was because uh, he got interested in how literature is important uh, stylistically and formally in terms of the complexity of language and all the things we value, but also how literature is a form of um, social, can be a form of social action and of cultural work. And um, that was a big turn in American studies in the 1990s to kind of go from its more symbolic notions of what the country was to saying that literature had real life effects. And so something like Uncle Tom's Cabin, which also was not uh, always studied. I don't know whether it was studied in the 1970s in our department or not. Um, yeah. But once you start thinking about Uncle Tom's Cabin as um, you know, the book that started the war, uh, the little woman that started the big war, as Lincoln was said to have uh, said about Stowe, it became culturally important. Um, and so that's partly what's changed, uh, is that notion that you would look at some of these works as being culturally important, if not literarily important, but I think now they kind of have come together again because there's a lot of study of how the specific uh, plotting and language and use of realistic techniques comes into women's writing that is looking at it much more um, as in literary terms and that were in use in the 70s also, but the real turn came from, the, from thinking about culture, uh, I think, largely. Um, and one other little tidbit is that I've learned that um, Theodore Roosevelt loved Little Women and remembered reading it as a child. And so this hot notion that sort of real people, manly men, et cetera, didn't read Little Women is kind of a, a modern notion. I think in the 19th century, men and women loved it, wrote about it. Um, and we're just kind of, you know, we go through cycles that way. So. Robin, did you say something while I was, sorry. That, no, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I, I was writing about um, Uncle Tom's Cabin in my dissertation at Stanford in uh, 1980, and uh, my one of my advisors at the time was introducing me as a national expert on Uncle Tom's Cabin because there were no scholars who were specializing in Stowe at that time. It was, I mean, it was, it was right. kind of shocking when you think about it now. We but that's sort of the recovery of women, you know, and now there's wild Yeah, things. yeah, and, but, but I, and I'd add something too to what Susan just said, um, which I totally agree with about how this shift happened from was, is it literarily important or is it culturally important? But also just the definition of why we study literature has changed a lot since the 1970s. You know, in the 1970s, everybody knew what a great novel was. It had to be complex. It had to be ambiguous. It had to be metaphorically rich. Um, and it should be about universal subject matter, right? And Scarlet Letter is about universal subject matter. Little Women's not about universal subject matter, according to that definition. But part of the feminist challenge to the literary canon was to say, well, why? Why is complex writing better? Really, why is that better than writing that is, for example, sentimental, which is the way I would describe the writing of Little Women? Why is sentimental a bad word? And you know, there's no reason except that men wrote in a complex, uh, you know, literarily significant way about men's subjects, and women wrote in a sentimental way about domestic subjects. And that was the only reason one was valued more highly than the other. So that over the decades, we've managed to come to appreciate that the, the way that sentimental texts, the texts written by women, that marriage plot novels, the ways that they work which are different from, but not worse than, the ways that a novel by someone like Hawthorne or Melville works. Um, and that's what is exciting to me about that shift um, in the canon. Yeah, one of my uh, answers I always give to why we should have tenure in universities is the story that we just told. Because uh, I think women coming into the academy and then getting tenure and able to really do the research to help flesh out everything about um, Stowe and Alcott and all of those authors really opened up uh, the possibilities for students now to get a much wider array of texts to study than in the 70s. And when you have tenure, it allows you to kind of um, sort of use your peers to say this is important and to start changing it from sort of within, within your field. Um, you were held up as an expert on Stowe 
when uh, you were in, when you were writing about it, uh, Robin, and I was held up as an expert on Susan Warner, who's another very popular writer from the 1850s, uh, because I published an article on her in graduate school and put her on my exams, uh, my oral exams, and I was told at the time by the people on the exam, this would surely be the only time ever that we talked about Susan Warner during a PhD exam at Yale, but that I was the one to do it. So it's that kind of, um, it, it, it did take some work of women um, kind of proving that this is interesting and important. And actually, I've come to say that, that uh, yes, sentimental can be good culturally, but it also can be very effective. I'm the one who cried when Beth died. Um, but I also think Alcott is, I think her writing is complex. And I think the fact that the adaptations of it have gone in many different directions and that it has been rewritten so many times, um, it may not, it, it suggests that it is complex and it may not be every single sentence, but the way that it's put together and the way you think about the character and all of that, I still find it very rich, even in sort of traditional terms of what makes it a good novel. Um, but I also agree with what Robin said, that we've really decided like we want to, talk about books that people love to read as, and are culturally significant in addition to those that are linguistically complex like James Joyce, who I also love, but it's a different thing. Oh, let me just say to our book club members, um, if you love Little Women and you've never read The Wide, Wide World by, Susan, by Warner, um, that I definitely recommend, it's long. Um, and it's not as complex in the ways that we've been talking about as uh, Little Women, perhaps, but it's really fun to read. So I recommend that one. Actually, too. Joe reads it, I think. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, in Little Women, at one point she's reading it. Or it's getting it's, more. Oh, yeah. That's hot. yeah, that's the one that I had on my exam that I still love too. Yeah. All right, our next question from Karen. With regard to the book's relationship to social slash civic reform, would you speak to its social consciousness? The lessons that Marmee imparts to the girls, both explicitly and by the smaller acts that aid others, Marmee's efforts to aid the Hummels, et cetera. Um, <laughs> sure, uh, do you, do you, Robin, you wanna start or do you want me to? No, I, again, I already said a few words about that, so uh, I don't go ahead. Right, and I think uh, Marmee, Definitely, we haven't talked about the Hummel specifically yet, but it, the book and most of the movies do, do start often with that Christmas scene of helping um, an immigrant family that uh, needs food, that is also needs uh, help later, which is how Beth gets scarlet fever, where they need medical care. Um, there is this kind of uh, consciousness among the role of the mother to be somebody who looks after the community. And Robin, you did, you did say that, uh, and I think I really agree with that, that the morality, the moralization is about um, community building really and, uh, and seeing that that makes your life richer to do it. Um, uh, I'm interested that there's a line that Joe says, talking to Amy in the chapter called Calls, which is where they're sort of becoming socialites. Um, uh, Amy says, oh, Joe, I hope you, you know, you never marry a reformer because they're sort of no fun. Amy eventually kind of comes around to reform. Um, but Joe says, I do like reformers um, and I shall be one if I can. The world would never get on without them. Um, and so the need for reform and thinking that this is women's work is something that is at the heart of the cultural work of the novel. Um, and I think is something that some of the most recent adaptations have really uh, brought out. Uh, I would go back to Aunt March, who I mentioned also briefly when I started talking uh, at the beginning of our time together. Uh, the, one of the most recent adaptations uh, of um, Little Women was on um, public TV and on the BBC and it had Angela Lansbury as Aunt March, who was wonderful. It was on Masterpiece uh, and it was about two years ago. And there's a wonderful scene in rewriting of Little Women in that adaptation where Angela Lansbury playing uh, Aunt March sort of storms into the March's house uh, as Marmy has been called to Washington to take care of her husband um, who has been at the war and is uh, 
fading and has had this uh, illness. And um, Angela Lansbury, it's, a, it's not in the novel. Um, in the novel, Aunt March gives some money, but Joe actually gets the money instead by cutting off her hair to get the train, to pay for the train to go to Washington for mommy. But uh, Angela Lansbury sort of storms in and says, I want to give you this money because we need women to go to Washington uh, because they will seek the truth and uh, we need them to find out the answers. And so there's this kind of interesting way of showing that these, these generations of women, so even Aunt March, who's a generation above Marmy, um, uh, could be seen as somebody who in her own way is thinking about um, how to be civic-minded and, and kind of think about reform. And, um, and it, it kind of goes throughout all the novels. The, uh, Little Men, uh, which is the sequel to Little Women, and then Joe's Boys. Little Men has quite a bit about um, suffrage in it. Uh, and there's a character named Nan, who's uh, one of Joe's, who's one of the little men in the school and is kind of a Joe prototype who uh, is really interested in the women's right to vote. Uh, so it, it, it circulates in a lot of different places. Great, our next question, um, a combination of two comments from Jennifer and Nicole. Um, good to see you again, Professor Warhol. I was wondering if you think Joe might have turned into a transgender or gender fluid character if Little Women had been written today. And the second part of the question, is there anything you wish was different about the book or story in general or from our modern feminist point of view? Yes, I, you know, just reading the very first few pages of about Joe's, the way she regards her boots in a gentlemanly manner, <laughs> and not just what she says, but everything about the way she moves, the way she speaks, the slang she uses, you know, she's as close to genderqueer as a character could be in the 1860s. And I, I you know, I totally, I totally share that. You, know, you ask, is there something that could be different and make it better? I share that. Um, feeling that Susan has. I wonder if, if everybody who loves literature does this, where you read a book that you love and you know perfectly well how it's going to end. Um, and you, um, but you, but as you're reading it, you just think maybe this time, maybe this time it'll come out differently. Um, I found myself this time wishing that Joe could just be queer, you know, um, it, it, because there's so many ways in which Alcott um, is really embracing and celebrating that kind of um, gender nonconformism uh, that that Joe represents. Um, and so that was one of the things I was wishing could be different um, as as I got to the end of this. You know, I think I've read it enough times and and also I felt like the Gerwick movie helped me uh, reconcile myself to the idea that Joe and Lori are not a romantic match. Um, that Amy is the right girl for Lori, um, you know, so that I, if, if when I was little, I was hoping, you know, for a romantic um, reconciliation of Joe and Lori at the end. I don't wish for that anymore. Um, I think I really just do wish that, uh, that Joe could have, could have been free to be Alcott. Um, but what I always tell my students, and I don't know if it's Jennifer or Nicole who's had me in class, but I always tell my students that, Weirdly, there are many more things that can happen to women in the real world in the 19th century than there are that could happen in fiction. You'd think that fiction would only be limited by authors' imaginations and that anything could happen uh, to a character who isn't a real person, right? But, um, but that's not the case. And um, the, the conventions of literature are so strong and um, they they're so self-perpetuating uh, that they're just they're just things that just aren't possible literally aren't possible to have happen in a 19th century novel so for joe to be that um explicitly uh transgender or genderqueer person it couldn't really happen but i feel like alcott got just as close as she possibly could and i think um the laurie and uh joe why they maybe shouldn't get married but why they also were such good friends yeah. Um, Lori also, um, you know, is sometimes called the fifth sister. Uh, he's not at war. He's younger enough, but he's also not typically male in some ways. Uh, and the fact that he 
um, is kind of in this women, in this girl space and goes uh, sort of back and forth a little bit. He's not maybe as gender fluid as Joe, which there are a couple slips even in the manuscript where it's spelled J-O-E, um, uh, where Alcott did that. And I think, you know, there is some element of um, her interest in thinking about different gender identities, I think, um, that she's playing with. And, and the fact that Lori and Teddy, you know, the real name is Theodore, um, but these sort of diminutive names that uh, they use for, for Lori, I think, are sort of getting at that a little bit as well. Uh, and that it's largely about kind of the creativity and fluidity that can come with childhood, but then does kind of get more scripted as you get older. And that is part of the growing up part that happens in the second volume. That's, that's a great point, Susan. And it reminds me of something I noticed in Showalter's introduction to the Penguin edition. There's this beautiful hardcover edition in the Penguin Classics now uh, that has a classic introduction from by Elaine Showalter. She talks about uh, that the text that they use in the Penguin is Alcott's original text, but that there was a, um, an, a revised version uh, that was circulating for a while, I guess at the end of the 19th century, uh, with changes that I don't think Alcott signed off on, changes to the language, where um, to make it a little more refined, they took out some of Joe's slang. And one of the phrases that had been changed, I recall, was uh, when Laurie makes, I think it's a queer little French bow, uh, and then it was changed to something like a, a little, a courtly little bow or something like that or a gentlemanly little bow. But I like that, a queer little French bow, right? I mean, it, queer didn't mean the same thing to Alcott that it does to us, but that, that whole image of the Frenchness of it, the littleness of it, the queerness of it, um, does give some gender fluidity to Laurie, and that's, that's quite early, right, um, in the novel. And, and um, another word that appears in the novel and in other places in Alcott, uh, especially in her sensational writing, which she did do under a pseudonym, is freak just the word freak. Um, she's kind of interested in what is freakish, which is typically somebody who's um, just whatever the main script is, is not there. And I think she, she was sort of thinking through some of that um, fluidity with the terms that she had available to her, one of which could be freak. Uh, I also think anybody who's seen Katherine Hepburn clips from the 1930s movie of Little Women, um, which has almost nothing about Joe writing, and I don't think even has um, the marriage at the end, it just kind of has, or the school, I mean, it just has kind of ending under the umbrella. But there's all these clips where, where Catherine Hepburn's kind of larger than life and comes galloping in and says, Christopher Columbus, you know, she's just sort of always being larger than life. And I think that that in the 1930s um, was really resonant sort of at the same time that these dolls were coming. Um, that Catherine Hepburn was was being a kind of, um, the word then was tomboy, but uh, that was very much something that was the top, the main thread of that movie. And I think it's not quite as much the thread of some of the more recent adaptations. And also Catherine Hepburn has the perfect accent and she says, mommy. She has the very perfect <laughs> So in the vein of this question, we have a comment from Nina. As an African-American, my initial reading of Little Women was as a 12-year-old. I recall loving and identifying with Joe. Reading it now, I wonder how much of the book I would have understood since the language was difficult for me, who was not accustomed to the type of language that is used in the book. The fact that the family was poor was relatable and drew me in. Reading it this time, I was waiting for the Black character to be more prominent And our next question, um, a combination of uh, remarks from Susan and Linda, how was Alcott viewed in her day? I read that when she traveled to England, she was shunned by Dickens. Was she well or poorly thought of by her contemporaries? And from Linda, was Little Women popular as a novel for young women as intended or did it appeal to a wider audience at the outset? I'll give that one to Susan who knows Alcott's biography much better than I do. Um, so the question is, how was the, what was the audience initially and also how was she viewed? And I, on, this, on the first one of sort of what was her audience, um, she did get a kind of multi-generational audience fairly quickly. 
Um, and the 1880s edition that you were just talking about, Robin, was important to that uh, in the sense that it, it kind of uh, made everything into one volume, made volume one and volume two in the United States anyway together and kind of uh, packaged it in a way that it had a different market niche than the girl's book that it was commissioned to be. Um, you do read in 19th century diaries and if you look at records of public libraries and who checked out books uh, about men and women checking out Little Women and about adults, um, including later Teddy Roosevelt, as I said, uh, sort of realizing that it was an important book to them. Um, some of that probably came also from the moralistic side of kind of a modern day um, Pilgrim's Progress, which we haven't talked about, but that's kind of the way it's set up initially is kind of as a story of travails to get to a, a higher uh, sort of maturity. Um, so it always has had a pretty wide audience. It's also had an international audience always. It was almost immediately published in England at the same time as the United States. Copyright law at the time meant that you had to physically go um, to be in England to get an international copyright, which Alcott didn't do. So it meant that um, she couldn't own the copyright in England, but it was very popular and was published for a long time still in two very separate volumes. Good Wives, we mentioned, was the name of the second one. But it got translated very early, even in um, the turn of the century, 20th century, into multiple European languages and has been seen as something that was very much a kind of uh, transnational. Uh, text as well, despite the fact that it has these American um, settings in terms of the Civil War, et cetera. Um, in terms of how Alcott was um, viewed, I think that the most sort of highbrow writers in the 19th century, many of whom at their core were friends of Louisa May Alcott primarily through her father, Bronson, who was a transcendentalist and um, I mentioned the Alcotts lived literally next door to the Hawthorns at a certain point. She knew Henry David Thoreau, she knew the Emersons, um, and they all, all of those writers kind of supported her writing, but what they really liked was not Little Women. They liked um, some of her other writing, in particular a book called Moods, which is alluded to in Little Women as the book that Joe Wright wrote that the publisher thought was too big and she had to kind of tear it apart and try to make it uh, palatable. But it's essentially about Emerson and Thoreau and their views of the world and sort of the dark, the views of nature and a lot more philosophical. Um, and uh, she also wrote a, a sort of critique of transcendentalism called Transcendental Wild Oats that was very popular partly because some people liked to critique the transcendentalists. So she was seen as a very literary, um, writer and she had a publisher for moods uh, who was a kind of highbrow publisher. She did other kinds of writing, her sensational writing she did under a pseudonym and people did not know until the 1950s that her more sensational stories under the name A.N. Barnard um, were Louisa May Alcott. So uh, she was sort of not known for that even though they have become somewhat popular now. Um, and in terms of Little Women, I think that uh, it was brief Expected that she wrote that and she was seen as a great author because um, she had such an influence on all of these uh, children and then their parents and sort of seen that. But I don't think she was respected literarily um, as much for Little Women as she was for some of her earlier writing, at least in the 19th century. And then it sort of switched over. Um, some of you may remember there's a card game called Authors. Uh, and it started in the 19th century where you have a card game that has famous authors and there's one for American literature. And um, Alcott was on that card game beside Hawthorne and Emerson and Thoreau and Poe um, as early as the 1880s. So she's been very respected as a key author for a long time. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned the card game because I was going to say that too, that uh, I remember being struck even as a child that there was a woman in that deck of cards, uh, that it was Alcott. Yeah, the only one, I think. Uh, yeah, the only woman, yeah. yeah she, there are, I don't think there are any women in the, uh, in the British version. Um, and I just wanted to quickly say, I didn't, as a Victorianist, I didn't know that anecdote about Dickens um, shunning her. 
Um, but it breaks my heart to hear it because Alcott obviously loved Dickens, right? With the Pickwick Club in Little Women. And she refers to Dickens characters. Uh, I think Amy's teacher is compared to this really bad teacher in Dombey and Son. It's like Dickens is the water she swims in. Um, so that makes me sad to hear. Yeah. I think that there was a sort of transatlantic competition in that somewhere too, that may be in addition to gender. Robin and Susan, would you like to share a closing thought about why Little Women endures? Robin, do you want to start? No, I don't have a closing thought about why it endures. And Clara, you told us to think about that, but I don't know because it's a great book, because it moves us, right? I think it will last a long, long time because it moves us. Um, Amen to that. Uh, my 12 year old self still felt moved and still does a lot of times when I read it. But I think um, also the fact that it is about um, sisters and a family relationship that people can kind of enter into across time and across uh, differences of culture and nation because some of the everyday uh, struggles that the family goes through about sisters who aren't getting along and then those who are going to support each other in difficult times that there's this kind of um, openness to it that that makes it not seem so set in a particular time so even though it is a civil war novel the fact that the relationships people see themselves in it they can identify at various times with being joe or with being marmy or with being aunt march and uh, i think that there's different characters different ages and as you are different ages, you can identify with different characters. And I, I really did appreciate the comment from the um, book club member who mentioned uh, that as an African American, she found uh, things to identify with in this novel, uh, which wouldn't be obvious, right? But I think that's a great example of what Susan is talking about. 